I'm losing everything. Everything I own is being taken away from me. And they set up a movie company right next to my outdoor patio, which is right over here. And people wonder why I'm protesting and why I have had enough. <laughs> they have not given us money and they have shut us down. We cannot survive. My staff cannot survive. Look at this. Tell me that this is dangerous, but right next to me as a slap in my face. And we need your help. We need somebody to do something about this. Welcome to Keith Knight, Don't Tread on Anyone and the Libertarian Institute. Today, I am joined by Kara Roth, author of The War on Small Business, How the Government Used the Pandemic to Crush the Backbone of America. Miss Roth, where is the best place to get the book? So I always tell people to support their local business bookseller, if possible, because that money stays in your community about 67 cents of every dollar. If you don't have access or you like to order online, there's a wonderful place called bookshop.org that fulfills from local business booksellers. And right up at the top of their page, you can see all the money that they have helped get to those small businesses, um, which is really meaningful. So those, those are my choices. But I'm a capitalist. As long as you get it, you know, that's up to you. Links to those will be in the description below. Ms. Roth, closing small businesses in the middle of a deadly pandemic was necessary to save lives. How do you respond? <laughs> um, why was it necessary to, to close small businesses and not the big businesses that were next door? I didn't notice that there were any pools of death that were reported from either of those locations. Um, I'm uncertain as to why you could go to a big box retailer and get your pet's nails groomed and your pet's hair done, but I couldn't go to a beauty salon and get my nails done or, or hair done and why there was that disparity between the employees. Um, and certainly if you had any data or science to back that up, which nobody did, you would have to compensate people for taking their property for the good of society. That's eminent domain uh, within the, the, the Fifth Amendment of the Bill of Rights. So, you know, if, if you were going to make some sort of scientific and data-driven reason why a small business <laughs> needed to be shut down for society, there's a compensation piece that went along with that that was absent. Um, none of this was done based on data and science. It was done based on political clout and connections. And uh, I have yet to see one piece of data that proves otherwise. When it comes to the closures, did you find any correlation between uh, people who stayed inside versus people who didn't lock down countries or cities or states that locked down and those that didn't? How can we actually put this theory to the scientific test? So certainly um, I am not a data scientist, but I am a numbers person. I've been in the, the numbers realm uh, my entire life. And, and early on, it was very clear that the impactful factor was if you were older um, or if you were very you know, heavy and obese and may have had some additional risk factors that way, it wasn't based on other factors. Now, certainly we know that um, you know, the spread outside was different than the spread inside. But we were never going to stop the spread of a virus. I mean, that was an insane thing. And I think we have proven that out um, that, you know, now, multiple years later, regardless of the place, even if you were on an island and locked it down, you still cannot you know, prevent the spread of the virus. The idea was to slow the spread or to protect the people who were vulnerable. And I, there have definitely been um, some folks who uh, you know, are within the medical community that will tell you the opposite, that will tell you the, the fact that uh, people weren't able to get sick and get over it and, and develop natural immunity actually potentially prolonged it. So um, you know, the, the data, and you can look you know, by country, if the younger populations did better than the ones that had the the older populations, the thing, same thing by state. Um, also, the states that decided they were going to have mandates where they put COVID patients back into nursing homes, um, that skewed data because obviously that created a lot of contagion and unfortunately deaths in the beginning. 
And those skewed numbers that models were built upon erroneously, thinking that that was representative of entire populations instead of just you know the people with those risk factors. So it was sort of sold to us as sort of putting pause on the TV. Uh, we're sort of putting pause on the world. And then when we come back, we'll just pick up sort of where we left off. How would you explain the secondary, tertiary consequences of things like the lockdowns to people who say, well, you didn't go to work. Most of us got checks. And then we went back. What are some of the costs or downsides of these lockdowns? All right, so let's back up a minute. And you know, the, the interesting part is when we talk about lockdowns, depending on where you live or your personal experience, you're going to have a different perspective. But most people seem to believe that there were broad lockdowns and we were all in this together. And that very much wasn't the case, that the brunt was borne um, by small businesses. As we know, those bigger competitors were allowed to stay open and people who had alt alternate means of working were allowed to continue on doing what, what, they, what they did. Um, the stock market was well supported. You know, Amazon's warehouse could stay open. So it was able to continue on for much longer than those proposed 15 days to slow the spread because the people with those clouded connections were impacted. If those had been shut down, if you couldn't go to the grocery store, you couldn't get your Amazon delivery and your stock you know, portfolio was in free fall, um, probably those big entities with clout would have said, this is ridiculous. We can't do this. And it would have shut it down within those 15 days. But because they weren't impacted and they were actually benefiting in multiple ways, both from their competitors being closed, as well as the support um, from the Federal Reserve, as well as all the stimulus, you know, they, they love this. This was a huge bonanza for them. Um, so I think, you know, that that's sort of the first piece. The second piece, as you alluded to, was this idea that you could just turn on and off the economy like you were power cycling a modem or I think you said hitting pause on the on the TV and assuming that there wouldn't be any impact. And this is unfathomable because I've had discussions with people all along going, these are the kinds of things that are going to happen. I wrote them about them in my book. They disrupted the labor market, the way that it was constrained uh, in, in terms of the way that they structured it to make it con more constrained and had a bunch of people leave the, the labor market, 3 million early retirees, 2 million legal immigrants that otherwise would have come in and a bunch of people who traded crypto, started side jobs or just said, you know, I, I don't care. I'm just not doing anything because of the way that this was structured. And that created this epic supply demand imbalance in labor. It sort of wreaked havoc on the supply chain. And with all of the stimulus and the Fed intervention that went along with this, um, created, as we know and are living through, historic inflation. And just at every part of the way, it's insane. Like, if you said, well, you really needed the Fed to come in and prop up the stock market because, you know, there were liquidity issues or it was an emergency or whatever ridiculous reason you want to come up with, then you can say, fine, but when did it cease to be an emergency? Because this happened in March of 2020. By June 5th of 2020, the NASDAQ hit an intraday record high. So if you have the stock market hitting record highs, I would say that's no longer emergency that you need support, yet the Fed continued to suppress rates and continued to you know, add to its balance sheet. By the way, neither of those policies were stopped until a couple of months after we hit 40-year historic highs on inflation. That's something that should have been seen in the distance by quote-unquote experts that are making multi-trillion dollar decisions and impacting our, our economy. So all of the, these issues, um, the inflation, the disruption of labor, the disruption of supply, you know, other supply demand imbalances have created an environment that really um, is frankly hurting everyone. I mean, it, it really, at the end of the day, it was all for naught. But the people who are the little guys, you know, the average person on Main Street, the average small business is much, you know, in a much worse position to be able to weather that than somebody who is wealthy, a, a business that is well capitalized and can take a long term view. And so all of this just ends up being an epic long term wealth transfer. The magazine or website Jacobin actually had a tweet. I, it didn't come to me until now, <laughs> but uh, it actually reflected a, what a lot of people that I went to college with uh, would say that, look, these small businesses, 
I don't care if they go under. They're greedy, profit-seeking institutions. If they all burn down tomorrow, well, tough luck. That's sort of like a predator drowning. Uh, wh why is it that uh, small businesses are not these terrible things that we should see as uh, parasitic, but they're actually a net benefit to society? It's so fascinating to me that the the socialist faction, um, you know, doesn't like the little guy. Like it's it's, it's, it's hard. Him. It's a lot of mental gymnastics. I might have to give a gold medal in mental gymnastics for that one because it is, you know, the opportunity for each person to create freedom and, and economic freedom and to to create wealth and to do well for themselves. And it's a push back on these big corporations and big special interests and big government. And you would think that that, you know, if you're somebody who wanted to support the, the little guy, that would be great. You don't want Amazon to have all that power. You don't want Walmart to have all that power. You don't want your know, name the company to have all of that power. You want that to be dispersed amongst the people, right? Isn't, isn't that the spirit, the principle of what we're talking about? Well, that's what small business does. You know, before COVID, if you just took the economy and, and cut it in half, you had half in the hands of what's now like 32.6 million small businesses. Um, they created about half the GDP and almost half the employment. And the other half was concentrated in like 20 plus thousand big businesses. So yeah, I don't understand why they would say that these small businesses are the ones who are greedy. I mean, they're fulfilling a need in the market. If they don't do that, then they end up going under, but they're competing in a contest that is rigged. And that's the problem is that, you know, if they were competing in a, a fair contest and maybe they had some advantages and some disadvantages, you know, you let it play out. Um, but when, you know, the, the referee goes and, and gets with the people who are judging it and says, well, you know, let's just change everything around so that the big guys win. Um, that's something you would think that the people who care about the every man would certainly be behind. Uh, I have a hard time explaining crazy, but you know that's kind of the, <laughs> the basis of it. <laughs> it's it's very easy to, uh, to to explain. If someone voluntarily offers you products, services, or a job, that's evil exploitation. Ah. If they're running around burning down your city, well, that's your good comrade, and yes. we need to uh, unite with them against the bourgeoisie. Yes, but force force versus free choice. So that seems like a, a really interesting dynamic there. <laughs> always, always. Okay, lockdowns weren't that bad. They only closed non-essential businesses. <laughs> Tell me, well, first of all, it, you can explain how that's a lie, but talk to me about this term non-essential, how they issued this opinion to the public and they s just separated people from the essential and the non-essential. This was bizarre. Non-essential to whom? Non-essential by whose decision? I, I mean, if you're putting food on the plates of your family it seems like you're pretty essential to your family if you're offering a you know value to um you know keeping your employees employed that's a value to them that flows through the community like i the idea that the government would like put people in these boxes um i mean in a sense i'm glad that they did it because it, it put it pretty much out in the open and it shows just how dangerous this sort of collectivist attitude is the thing I find the most fascinating, you know, now being able to look back on what's happened after a couple of years, is that the people who were essential and the people who were heroes, once they didn't comply, once they decided that they didn't want to get vaccines for whatever reason, they didn't believe in them, they had, had already had it, had natural immunity, they had a religious exemption, whatever, then all of a sudden <laughs> you were essential and you were a hero yes. and you worked the whole time, but now you can no longer have a livelihood because we've now changed what we have deemed as important to our narrative and you are no longer going along with it. So apparently you were very essential then, but not so essential now. And, and you know that that's what happens when you allow um, some group of people to, to make these decisions instead of this being based on individual rights and, and free choice and, and opportunity. Um, they, they decide, they make decisions according to what they like, and then that shifts you know, at their whim. And that is not a way um, to have freedom, to have wealth creation, to have set, success, uh, or any of the other key ingredients that you would want in terms of a, an economy and a nation.
Chapter 5 is selling out Main Street to Wall Street, the Federal Reserve's decades-long role in helping government transfer more wealth to the wealthiest. What is the Federal Reserve? How is it an upward transfer of wealth in its activities? So the Federal Reserve is the central bank of the United States. It is a quasi-government agency. It's supposed to be independent, uh, but they get their authority from Congress. And if they make a profit, they give it back to the Treasury and they all sort of, you know, collude on, on what it is they're going to do. So, you know, is it really independent? You know, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Sure, sure, it's independent. Um, but they make the monetary policy decisions and somehow think that, you know, changing around interest rates and now going in and, and meddling in markets and being a buyer of treasury securities or mortgage, mortgage backed securities um, somehow is the ultimate way that they can ensure that we have full employment and stable prices. Now, they have done such a good job at stabilizing our prices that we have now, based on their decisions in conjunction with what they've enabled from the government in terms of overspending, um, we now have you know historic inflation. So I'm going to go ahead and say they're probably not that great. But there is this weird nexus of power um, between the you know the Federal Reserve and the sort of you know financial services company, the Treasury and the government, big business interests that all work together, and they create these like crazy boom and bust cycles. And because they the wealthy and well connected have the balance sheets to be able to wait that out, they end up benefiting. You know they on the upside have more invested, so they do well then. And when things go bust. And all the little guys are sort of flushed out of the market. They act in the sort of vulture capital way and go in and pick off whatever is left at bargain basement prices and mm. are positioned for the next run up. So that's really, um, you know, over the last 30 plus years, kind of how I viewed the Fed it really started with Alan Greenspan and his Greenspan put where he was basically saying, I'm not going to let the market ever go down so much without intervening, you know, basically allowed for excessive risk taking. And, you know, basically they think they they project that they're smarter than everyone else and that they are going to do a better job. But really, it is just a mechanism to make sure that their cronies are taken care of and it ends up being a wealth transfer. Um, so it started with Greenspan, Bernanke um, under at the Great Recession financial crisis. You took it to another level. Yellen perpetuated that. And then Powell you know, what he's done over the last couple of years is just complete insanity. And yet he was rewarded with another term. Um, so they are all in it together. It's a really bad thing for our economy and for wealth creation, for stability of our money. And unfortunately, it is opaque by design. Not enough people understand it. And so we don't have people um, like they did, you know, back in the 80s, marching on Washington, you know, for what the Fed did. We should be doing that now. But there just aren't enough people who really fundamentally understand the mechanism. And that really is by design. Chapter eight is protecting the smallest minority, how individual rights and capitalism set the foundation for economic freedom. What is it uh, that you mean when you say protecting the smallest minority? So this is a, an Ayn Rand um, sort of concept that the smallest minority in the world is the individual. And so if you really want to protect, um, you know, going against the grain of the mob, you have to protect the individual and the individual rights in which we've been endowed by our creator. And, you know, those are the most sacred. Go government's job isn't to be a nanny, a fairy godmother, a sugar daddy, a provider, whatnot, that they're the, the way that our um, representative constitutional republic was formed was for them to uphold and protect our individual rights. And unfortunately, they have done just the opposite. They've gone into the position of subjugating those and, you know, becoming all of those other things, sugar daddy and fairy godmother and whatnot, um, you know, to basically, you know, our detriment. You know, the, the closer we get to that, that free market, free choice scenario where we have the, the guardrails of property rights and, and individual rights being protected, the more prosperous we are and, frankly, 
everybody else ends up being, you know, by uh, by default. And as we've moved away from that, um, you know, that's where people who are, you know, working and saving and you're trying to do the right thing and still not able to get ahead and they kind of can't peg what's wrong. You know, that really is the, the core of what's wrong here. So if I'm someone who sort of sees the world as an oppressed versus oppressor kind of uh, layout, and I just want the working class to do well, uh, I, I sort of throw these things like, you know, screw the Canadian truckers because I have to because I support Trudeau. <laughs> if I really just want to help the working class and the poor, I just want to give people opportunities. Why should I embrace this sort of uh, pro small business for uh, pro free market ideology? Well, I would just look at the results. I mean, the, the people who have been, um, you know, quote unquote, oppressed or had the fewest opportunities are those, you know, typically in urban areas of big cities like, you know, my city of Chicago that are controlled, you know, by those people who espouse those values. Yet I have not seen the benefits uh, being ascribed to them. Um, you know, they're, they're not building wealth. They're not creating opportunities for themselves to get to the next level and, and pass things on to the next generation. We pay for their schools, but their, their schools are, are certainly run in a worse manner than those that are in wealthier neighborhoods. Um, so, you know, basically by saying we're going to trust somebody else to know what's best for us instead of ourselves, they've given up the opportunity to create and participate in that economic freedom. I can tell you from somebody who comes from a financial background, I've been an advocate of wealth for the little guy because I benefited from it. My father was an electrician and grew up on the west side of Chicago. Um, you know, my grandmother used to wash paper plates, not only through the de depression, but the entire time that I knew her. And, you know, was the first person in my family to, to graduate from college. Wealth comes from ownership. And it comes from owning anything, owning a home, investing in stocks and owning that, owning your small business. But in order to have wealth, you have to own something that appreciates in value. That's what creates wealth. And being on the government dole never does that. The government doesn't create wealth. They have no mechanism to create wealth. All they do is move dollars around. But we know that doesn't work. We've seen lottery winners who've won tens of millions of dollars who end up bankrupt because you know they were just given something. They weren't given the skills. They didn't earn it and they didn't invest it in something that, that created that wealth opportunity. If we want people to be able to participate in wealth, they need to participate in ownership and having a decentralized free market economy accomplishes that. We're having something that is a centrally planned economy. We're seeing we're seeing what happens to that. You know, five dollar gas, historic inflation. You know, th these are the things that happen when the people who think they know better than everybody else um, take hold. And we have living proof that now people can point to. I like what you said about giving people the opportunity because you can think that even below minimum wage jobs like internships that pay zero dollars an hour. Well, this is so bad. We need to outlaw these. Well, look, you can have all the opinions in the world, but give someone that opportunity Oof. if they want it. Offer them an alternative. And it, that's why the opportunity aspect is uh, mm -hmm. so different. Thomas Sowell sums this up very well. He said, the very same people who say that the government has no right to interfere with sexual activity between consenting adults believe that the government has every right to interfere with economic activity <laughs> between consenting adults. How has such a scam been able to uh, c come to fruition and fool so many people blatantly uh, in so many high places? I mean, we could spend an hour on Sowell quotes, right? I mean, he's just so, he's so incredible. And, you know, the way he talks about greed and the way he kind of puts one thing against each other. I don't know. I think that people just aren't principled. And and I, I put this on both sides of, of the major aisle. I know that you're, you're libertarian and, you know, kind of in the middle. But, you know, if you look at the two big cl classes, neither of them has sort of a strong commitment to principles and individual rights. It seems like they like big government when it suits whatever narrative that they they have. And it, it is a good question to ask people is, you know, why do you think this is okay when that's not okay? And it's never based on 
a basic principle like oh because you know i believe in the protection of the individual right it's because i believe in this but i don't believe in this or i understand this and i don't understand the other thing and so it's a very emotional and visceral response and i completely understand and don't blame people i mean i wasn't educated on a lot of this myself even though i went to you know the arguably the best undergraduate business school in the world you know it wasn't until I started um, accidentally getting involved in the political realm that some of these things really, you know, kind of occurred to me. So it's not something that's taught probably by design. Um, and, you know, it's unfortunate, you know, we, we lack economic and financial literacy. And, you know, that creates a pipeline of people who think because they don't have the, the vision and the deep understanding that that's going to make people's lives better. I also think there is a piece of it that is trying to outsource personal obligation. You know, it used to be that when we had issues, they were solved within our communities and with charities and by taking a personal responsibility. Now people feel like, well, I can just pay taxes and I will off, you know, offload this to the government and I'm sure they'll take care of it. And since, you know, I'm not paying in as much as somebody else, like, you know, I'm OK with them paying more. And, and so people are just kind of looking at it from a selfish perspective, which is OK. People are self-interested, um, but they have to understand that everybody else is self-interested, too. And that works not just at your level, but at the government level. And that's why these things that sound great in theory aren't in reality. And I have to tell you, Keith, you know, there is this like huge decoupling from reality that we're living through right now, whether it's the, oh, we're the MMT, the modern monetary theory, or I call them magic money tree folks who say, oh, well, we could just print as much money because we've got the printing press. Like, it doesn't matter. We'll, we'll never default on anything because we can we can just print more, you know, assuming that there was going to be no consequences to that. Or the people who are pushing the green agenda and being like, we need to, to be green and decarbonized. And trying to move us away from that without having a viable replacement that works today at scale, you know, at an appropriate price. You know, you've got people who are living in fantasy worlds and it sounds nice to some people, you know, rainbows and unicorns, but in reality, it sucks. And so we need to get back to reality and have the reality check. And we now have all of the data of which I'm sure somebody's going to say, oh, well, it you know, was different or it wasn't really tried the right way this time. But no, we, we need to just stop indulging the fantasies and go, okay, we listen to your insanity. We get that you feel this way. But in reality, this is not how it works. And have that reality check, that come to Jesus meeting with people who are living in, in a complete fantasy world because they have had the privilege of living in the United States of America during an unusually prosperous time, the best time to ever be alive in history, the best place to ever live in history. And this is the anomaly. <laughs> this isn't the, isn't the rule. And I just think people don't have um, enough you know, depth and worldliness and understanding of history to really have a grasp on that or reality. Yeah, I wish the modern monetary theorists could just make a phone call to Haiti and tell them, <laughs> you idiots, print more. You're welcome. Goodbye. Right. Tell North Korea. Zimbabwe. Why, uh, works Zimbabwe, out well for there, come right? Come on. Turkey. Please. Turkey. It's good, going great there. Raise the minimum wage. Just, just yeah, do it. Right. There's a study, The Impact of Regulatory Costs on Small Firms, 2010, from the Small Business <laughs> Advocacy Association. The cost of federal regulations by firm, by firm size per employee, $7,700 for big business, 500 or more employees, and 10500 for small businesses, meaning that every additional regulation literally helps big business at the expense of small business giving consumers less choice and employees less choices. What are uh, what is some reason that people should have to believe that regulation, the idea of helping the consumer or worker, actually hurts the consumer or the worker? So I can just give you an, an anecdote, because um, as we were talking about, sometimes just the seeing what happens makes it more clear to people. So I have a scenario for example, where I have a small business in Chicago and I have a worker who works from home on the computer 
answering emails and, you know, <laughs> doing that kind of thing. A very highly dangerous job, right? Sitting on your computer. And I have to spend thousands of dollars a year and lots of paperwork headaches getting them workers' compensation insurance. Now, again, if, I, if they were working in a dangerous factory with blades and sticking their hands in there, I can understand. But please, anyone, Keith, explain to me, why does my worker who sits at home on their computer have to have workers' compensation insurance? There's no reason. And by the way, what happens to be my sister? So, you know, like it's even like it's even dumber. So the the thought is that, you know, that's money that it costs me to have this employee that could be going to that employee or it could be, you know, with the other stupid regulations and things that I have to pay for, you know, other other people and other facets of my business could be going to hiring more employees and growing the business, but instead is going to the profiteers. It's going to these insurance companies who are big, who have lobbied the state of Illinois, who brags that they have more you know, insurance firms that work with them than any other state out there, which I don't know why they're bragging about, um, because you know they're all seeking rent. They're all seeking profits at the expense of my small business. And so I'm not getting to direct that and I'm not doing that in a way that is adding to, um, you know, profit centers and making people's life better and increasing productivity. It's just a money grab. And I have a small business community. I surveyed them a few years ago. They said they spend 40 percent of their time on administrative items and things that don't directly produce revenue. So imagine even if you cut that in half, how much extra time letting a small business owner focus on growing their business and adding to people's lives and adding to the economy and, and, and getting more workers like, you know, how much better that would be for them, the communities, the people who work for them, the, the opportunity for wealth creation and so on and so forth. But instead, it, it's constrained in government, you know, BS and minutia. And as you said, the smaller the businesses, you know, we don't have human resource departments or, you know, these people who can, we can just kind of offload this to. This is coming from the people who are wearing all of the different hats in the business. And it ends up being very, very costly. You wrote a book, The Entrepreneur Equation, evaluating the realities, risks, and rewards of having your own business. Walk us through some of the myths about entrepreneurship. <laughs> so my favorite myth is that you get to be your own boss, right? Like that's the that's the, <laughs> the, the, the pinnacle. It's like, I'm going to leave. I'm sick of reporting to people. And then when you find out when you, you know, run your own business is that you report first and foremost to your customers, right? Because if you don't have any customers, you don't have any business. You report to your landlord and your vendors and your employees, and you're making sure that like everybody is happy, paid, taken care of before that like even comes to you. So it ends up being that you probably, especially in the beginning, have more hours worked, more stress and equal or less pay than if you just stayed at the job. But for some reason, people think that they, that they are now the boss. Um, and, you know, I think that's a big, big um, shock to people when they first start their own business. When looking at a lot of successful entrepreneurs, what are some of the traits that you most commonly see in those people that you think are a causal result of uh, their success or have led to their success? Yeah, there's a saying when you make an investment like as a VC or private equity that you are betting on the jockey, not the horse. And that really is the case that, you know, there are these personality traits that can make you very successful. I think um, having sort of the, the perseverance um, and the willingness to pivot at any point in time is huge. You know, you need somebody who's like going to keep trying to run through a wall, run through a wall, run through a wall. And then when it doesn't work, build a ladder and then try to climb the ladder. And when that doesn't work, then try to figure out a way around. And, you know, just that kind of a personality that they're not giving up, that they're tenacious, whatever happens, that they're going to pivot um, is really critical. And I also think that having some hubris and thinking big is pretty important too, um, because frankly, it's it's pretty much as difficult to start a small business as it is a big business, and you know having the the scale sometimes actually um, gives you 
some benefits and, and some leeway that you don't get as a small business. And so I think somebody um, who's willing to to think bigger and you know beyond just what's in front of them you know, is something that I would definitely look for in an entrepreneur. Um, you, you, yeah, you got to have the perseverance, you got to have the, the pivoting, and you got to have you know, sort of a, a, a bit of a vision there. When it comes to the risks of being a business owner, do you have a general idea of how many businesses uh, go under in one, two, five, ten years? <laughs> so, like, this is the mythical number structure because, like, you can ask all different kinds of people and all different kinds of sources, and they will all contradict each other. We know that the majority fail um, within the number that's usually um, quoted is three to five years period. So feel pretty good about that. And then it just kind of depends on the industry, like in restaurants, like 90 plus percent of them fail um, within, you know, kind of five to seven years. But I don't think that just the like straight up failure is as important as the failure to succeed, because there are a lot of small businesses that are kind of glorified hobbies or little side gigs, which is great. You know, again, you're making some money, but as long as you're viewing it as such, as long as this is not, you know, you understand that this isn't your livelihood and the only thing that you're doing. I think that, um, you know, the, the failure to succeed afflicts many, many businesses, probably the, the majority of them out there, and they never kind of get to that next level. The ones who do, um, you know, can earn a, a really nice living. Um, but, you know, there are a lot of people who kind of just get stuck in the, this is a thing, and it's a thing that I'm doing, and it's not really going anywhere. I'm sort of like on a treadmill or treading water. And, uh, you know, those are the people who really need to, to reassess and go, okay, are you going to get this? to the next level? Or, you know, is that maybe something else that you should be doing? Because not everybody was cut out to be an entrepreneur. It's not an easy thing. When it comes to what meeting consumer demand, uh, how is it that companies can constantly be innovating and keeping up with all the competition that's going on? Uh, what does an entrepreneur have to do to make sure they're staying on top of things? I think it depends on the entrepreneur you ask. You know, some entrepreneurs would say it's a, it's about taking the pulse of your customer and understanding what they want and giving it to them. The really visionary entrepreneurs, like the the Steve Jobses of the world, will say it's about projecting what you think they want that they don't yet know. And mm -hmm. so it becomes a really difficult balance. But it is amazing um, that just small shifts in the way that we do things and also small shifts in the environment create you know the right person pursuing the right opportunity at the right time if you go back to like the first dot com bubble there was a company called webvan that was a grocery delivery service and they went from like zero dollars to like a billion dollar ipo to bankrupt and out of business in a very, very short period of time. And part of it was just like the infrastructure. We didn't all have smartphones at that point in time. You know, the, the internet was very nascent. Um, you know, people were just in a very different space versus today. Think about all the things that, you know, are, are on demand and delivery, including in the grocery space. So part of it is just, you know, doing, getting the timing right and making sure that, you know, the infrastructure is there. Um, you know, it's the same idea and it was just executed differently with a different environment and backdrop. And that's been the difference in something that was, you know, a huge epic failure to something that's been very successful. Are you familiar with the difference between market entrepreneurs versus political entrepreneurs? <laughs> um, I have not heard those designations, but maybe understand the the underlying theme. Tell me, tell me what you're thinking. Well, uh, so the theory was put forth by Bert Folsom. He says, uh, vilifying the rich is a ridiculous concept. How did they get there? Did they get there as a result of lowering prices, staying innovative, or did they get handouts from the state? He uses all the examples of uh, for every Carnegie who did something in the free market, there were uh, people uh, lobbying the state yes. <laughs> instead. There, instead of uh, Vanderbilt uh, doing steamships, there was a guy Edward Collins who kept increasing the amount of money every year the state would give him. So, when it comes to this uh, important difference. Why is it uh, that we should look at uh, free market entrepreneurs yeah. to innovate as opposed to 
what is constantly being pushed on us. We need more federal funding for A, B, and C. Do you have an opinion on that? Yeah, I mean, it's just the, the basic philosophy that the um, the government shouldn't be a venture capital firm, right? You know, their, their job is to pr preserve and protect our natural rights. And as we have you know, ascertained and seen, even the quote unquote smartest people in the room have made a lot of really bad economic decisions. And they're making those decisions you know, from a human nature standpoint. They're making them from you know, the, the point of what's going to benefit them, what's going to get them more power and more dollars into their political coffers and whatnot. They're not actually doing anything to be benefit you. I think once people you know, get that point, that that's fine. Um, you know, it's very different than a traditional venture capital fund who participates in the upside with you. And so if, if you're giving them money to invest and they don't make any money, you know, they may have some small management fee, but, you know, ultimately they're not going to get the big paydays and eventually you're not going to invest with them again. So there is an alignment of incentives. There's a great Charlie Munger quote um, for people who don't know who Charlie Munger is. He is Warren Buffett's partner in Berkshire Hathaway. And he says, show me the incentive and I'll show you the outcome. And so you know, we know what the government's incentives are. And those incentives are not aligned with what benefits you and me, or, you know, frankly, the economy broadly. And so it's really important in any scenario to align those incentives. And the government shouldn't be in a position where it is picking winners and losers. That should be a function of the free markets. Um, and, you know, ultimately that has the, the built-in mechanisms to course correct over time, whereas with the government, um, it doesn't. There, there are no course correction benefits. And frankly, um, there's a ton of moral hazard. I mean, there are absolutely no consequences for not only being wrong, but like, out, you know, outright basically being fraudulent and doing nefarious things. I mean, maybe they get voted out of office, but like how many people have any real accountability um, you know, in government for the things that, that they have done, uh, regardless of what the outcome is? How can workers improve the amount of skills they have so they can demand a higher salary? So before the first skill that you should perfect is the asking for what you're worth skill and also asking for equity. Um, this is an unknown wealth creator for many people that if you work for a firm, whether it's public or private, that has shares of their company available, that sometimes you can get shares or options um, to buy shares you know, in the company and participate in the value that you are creating and participate in long-term wealth creation. And so your first skill that you should focus on is asking for more um, when it's appropriate and asking for some equity. Um, but, you know, it's funny. I really have this like feeling at heart that like you can teach people skills, but you can't teach people to give a damn. And so the biggest differentiators in the market right now are people who actually care, like who care about the customers they're serving, who care about their work product and their name um, and what they're delivering. And I think if you can focus on that, that's the most important skill. You know, things change around us all the time. We're learning new technologies and new industries and all kinds of things. And that's all stuff that you can, you know, go online and watch some YouTube videos or whatever and find out about. Mm -hmm. But to, to really be somebody who, you know, shows up and does the job and is dependable and kills it, like those are the people who are irreplaceable in any sort of, of jobs market. And so I would advocate to spend more time on sort of the soft skills than some of the, the hard skills. And final question. I've heard that almost every job is selling. When you're in an interview for the job, you have to sell yourself. When it comes to sales, do you have any tips for people how, can, uh, how people can improve the amount of sales they have or be a better salesperson in general? Yes, this is important for entrepreneurs too, because entrepreneurs a lot of times hate to sell and it, that, you know, that's just where we are. So um, there's a saying that I use that everybody is tuned into their favorite radio station and that is called WIIFM, what's in it for me? 
And I think when people sell, they don't spend enough time going into the other person's shoes and putting it from their perspective and focusing on what's the benefits for them. How is it going to make them smarter with their boss or sell more or whatever it is that is their issue that you're solving for them? Like most people don't care about like the the typical marketing push bells and whistles that you hear about. They just want to know, you know, how does this help me? How does it make me better? And so if you want to sell more, um, you have to put yourself in their, you know, in their shoes. I will also say it's a numbers game and just get used to rejection. And so if you were just a terminator about I'm going to call, you know, X many people or email or have lunch or however you do your selling with this many people, amp that up and be consistent um, and, you know, and, and have those consistent touch points that the consistency and the persistence is key. And a lot of it is, is that money ball is those numbers. Um, but, you know, if you're finding even with those numbers, you're not doing the right thing. It's probably because you're not tuned into WIIFM. The book is The War on Small Business, How Government Used the Pandemic to Crush the Backbone of America. Links will be in the description below. Ms. Roth, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me.